Now on to our main event. We're delighted to welcome author Gretchen Soren and WITF's Scott Lamar to Harrisburg. Scott Lamar has worked in both radio and television for more than four decades. Currently, Lamar is the host and executive producer of the Daily Smart Talk News and Public Affairs program on 89.5 and 93.3. Previously, Lamar was WITF's TV's senior public affairs producer. He has won more than a dozen Pennsylvania Associated Press Broadcast Awards since 2000 and has been nominated for five, count them, five Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards. Our author here this evening is Gretchen Soren. She is a distinguished professor and director of the Cooperstown Graduate Program of the State University of New York. She has curated innumerable exhibits, including with the S Smithsonian, the Jewish Museum, and the New York State Historical Association, and she lives in upstate New York. The book we are here for this evening is titled Driving While Black, African American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights, which is now the basis for a major upcoming PBS documentary by Rick Burns. And I'll leave you here with just one quote from Rick Burns himself. He says about the book, Gretchen Soren has spent decades exploring this deeply researched, acutely felt, and penetrating study of race, space, and mobility in America, and a lifetime thinking about the issues and experiences that underlie it. No one who reads Driving While Black can fail to be moved and wonderstruck by how far American society has come in the last century and a half in forwarding the dream of equal mo mobility for all and by, by how far we still have to go. Without further ado, please join me in giving a warm Harrisburg welcome to Scott Lamar and Gretchen Soren. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And before we get started, uh, Ms. Soren, do you know when the PBS uh, documentary will air because I, even at WITF, they wanted me to find out if, because we knew it was coming, but <laughs> we don't know when. Um, I talked to Steeplechase Films yesterday, uh -huh. and it should be finished by midsummer and hopefully broadcast on PBS by the end of the, before the end of the year, so October, around October. Okay, we'll be, we'll be looking forward to We're waiting for, that. for the uh, PBS date. Okay. All right, so what inspired you to write this book? Um, as you heard, I am an exhibition curator, primarily, and I was working on an exhibition in Saratoga Springs, mm -hmm. New York, which is um, a resort town north of Albany. And I, a, a colleague of mine, uh, who is also a professor, uh, handed me a little tiny, it was the cover of the Negro Motorist Green Book. All she had was the, a Xerox of the cover. And I was intrigued, and she asked me if I knew anything about it, and I said, nothing at all. Um, and this was 20 years ago, before it was a motion picture, before anybody knew anything about it. Um, and I was intrigued by it and started researching it at, at that point. And that's how, I got, that's how I got started. And I realized that the story that, I'm, that I wanted to tell is, is much broader than the Green Book. The Green Book is what everybody has kind of been focused on, but this story is much, much broader, and it's really a story about mobility and about African-American travel and really about the automobile, and that's what really captured, that drew me in. How much did you know about African-American travel before 20 years ago when you opened that Green Book? What I knew about was, um, as a child, being put in the back seat, the way back of, an, of a station wagon with my brother and pillows and blankets and driving from Newark, New Jersey, where my parents lived, um, in an integrated neighborhood to the all-black community of Fayetteville, North Carolina, where my mother had grown up every single summer. And um, I, I guess I thought my father was peculiar. Um, we would get up at two or three in the morning and drive in the dark and carry all of our food and never stop except by the side of the road and never go to a bathroom and never uh, go to a, never stayed overnight uh, until we got to Fayetteville. Uh, I guess I thought my, my, both my brother and I thought my parents were peculiar for doing that, but it never dawned on me that there was a reason they were, they were doing those things. Okay. So that's the travel I knew. You, as you mentioned, your mother grew up in Fayetteville, but uh, your father was always apprehensive. Now, what you just described can show how apprehensive he really was for stopping. But did you know why he was apprehensive? No idea. But my father was a New Yorker. He wasn't from the South. 
and as I dug into this story, I, I knew that my father had met my mother in Fayetteville. Um, I didn't realize that he had been drafted in 1941, and then he was sent to, to Fayetteville, um, where Fort Bragg is. And as a northerner, and, and this happened to scores of African-American soldiers, they were sent to southern, most of, the, most of the bases in this country are in the south. And so a lot of northern soldiers were sent to bases in the south where all of a sudden they faced uh, the, the segregation they didn't, didn't know was there. Mm. I guess they did know it was there, but they didn't, they didn't know they were gonna have to put up with it. Mm. Uh, when you say that he was apprehensive, uh, I remember reading in the book that he also couldn't wait to get back in the car and head back for New York. Now, that had nothing to do with being with the, the in-laws, huh? <laughs> I actually don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Not to make light of it, but still. <laughs> no, I, I actually don't think so. I, my father never did lo embrace the South again. Um, after he got out of the Army, he never did want to go back um, south and never did want to spend time there. Mm -hmm. What did you jump it around a little bit because there's so, the book is so rich in history that there's a lot to talk about with history but in the title The Road to Civil Rights did the automobile pave the way for civil rights? I think the automobile made the civil rights movement possible. I don't think the, the civil rights movement could have been fought and won without the automobile. Why? If you, if you think about the size of a county or the size of a state, um, people were going around and they were registering voters. Well, when you're registering voters, you've gotta to go to every little town and the only way to do that is with an automobile. You had to have cars to do that. And there were actually um, buses and small, small cars and, and uh, VW buses that went around in, in different states. We found one uh, that went around specifically in South Carolina um, that were used to, they were kind of like rolling schools and they would teach people how to, pa how to pass the poll test. Because if you were African American um, and you wanted to register to vote in most of the southern states, you had to pass a poll test. Um, and they were very difficult. You might have to recite parts of the state constitution, um, answer a lot of questions that were very difficult. And so there were uh, vehicles that went around and they were schools and they would teach you how to pass the test. But also, um, if you think about the Montgomery bus boycott, people had to get to work. They had to get to work and the only way for them to get to work was the bus. So if you take them off the bus, if they boycott the bus, how are they going to get to, to work? They can't all walk. And so um, Martin Luther King and the leaders of the boycott, they used the money they purchased a fleet of automobiles. And they used those automobiles as well as private automobiles and black taxi cabs to take people to work. So, uh, and that wasn't only in Montgomery, there were boycotts in other cities as well. So all of those cars really facilitated the civil rights movement. And there's one more, th and there's one more thing. Um, cabs were segregated in the South. And so if you flew in to Atlanta or you flew in to Tallahassee or Birmingham or any city, any southern city as a civil rights worker, you could not get a cab from the airport to your hotel. So you were stuck at the airport unless there was someone to pick you up with a car or what most of them did was to rent a car. And so car rentals became a part of the automobiles that were used um, very extensively in the civil rights movement. Did rental car companies have an issue with renting to African Americans? A lot of the rental car companies were willing to rent to African Americans because they wanted the money. You know, it was, it was all about the cash. Mm -hmm. And there are some other examples of that too, uh, especially uh, post-World War II. We'll talk about that for, uh, in, in just a moment. But uh, cars were described as the great equalizer when it came to between the races. Now, didn't equal things out exactly, but did give African Americans a lot more freedom to travel once automobiles became affordable, uh, once there were, they were readily available to 
people from any races, correct? Yes. So if you, if you think about it, if people were traveling by wagon, horse and wagon, it's very slow. And when two wagons encountered one another on a, on a road, um, white people expected deference. They expected that African Americans would allow them to go first, um, would stop, would not go over a bridge. If there was a bridge, there would be um, deference. But with the automobile, you couldn't tell quickly what the race of the person was. And so municipalities had to say that traffic rules could not take race into consideration um, as far as, as um, deference was concerned because of the, of the speed of the automobile. Even at 45 miles an hour, um, it, was, it was hard to tell immediately who was who behind the wheel. Now, was this only in the South? So in the South, we know about the signs, right? We know about the colored only signs. Um, but in the North, there was discrimination that was de facto. And African Americans knew what the rules were. The, the rules of etiquette changed from place to place. Um, and if you lived in a particular place, you knew the rules of etiquette. And in the North, there were strict rules of etiquette. And African Americans knew where they could go and where they couldn't go, um, what restaurants they might go into, what, what hotels um, and most hotels they were, they were banned from, what clubs they were banned from, even in Harlem. Um, there were places that African Americans could not go. The Cotton Club, for example, was segregated. Um, African Americans performed there, but they couldn't. Um, they couldn't stay there. Um, they couldn't. They couldn't use the use the club. So um, in the North, there was de facto segregation. Um, in the South, it was. Uh, in in some ways, it was easier to know what the rules of etiquette were in the South because of all the signs. Mm. Uh, you mentioned etiquette. Uh, when you think about the history of this country and you think about the etiquette, one of the names that uh, comes up in the 20th century is Emily Post, who was uh, most famous for writing uh, books about etiquette. She was considered America's expert on etiquette. You mentioned in the book that Emily Post actually commented on, I don't know whether she said it specifically, you tell me, about African Americans and cars. Um, Emily Post was really talking more about social class. Um, she was concerned that people were buying cars that were above their station. And that, uh, if you, that you should own a car that was appropriate to, to the place that you, you fit within the social, within the social structure. Um, and many people took that to mean that African Americans should not own nice cars. They shouldn't own Cadillacs, they shouldn't own large cars, they should own modest, inexpensive, otherwise known as cheap uh, <laughs> cars. And that, um, but that was also true of the white working class that Emily Post did not feel, um, she thought people were getting a little too uppity um, by buying cars that were beyond their, uh, their social, social class. What's it have to do with etiquette? What's it got to do? <laughs> I mean, I, is, is Emily Post like uh, the social commentator of America at that time? Uh, it sounds I, that way. I think she was the upper class social commentator. Ah. Um, and um, she felt that, that people that were driving around in big cars were, were behaving in a way that was um, inappropriate for their social class, especially if you were you know, a working class person or a person of color. You shouldn't. You know, you shouldn't be out there showing off. I wonder what kind of car Emily Post had. <laughs> I doubt that she drove her own uh, Probably car. not. <laughs> you know, you probably could Google that today and, and, and find a picture. But you mentioned bigger cars. Over the years, uh, many African Americans, maybe just amongst whites, but got a reputation for driving bigger cars. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Cadillacs. But in the book, you talk about some of the brands that uh, African-Americans drove. Now, before we get into the brands, why did blacks choose bigger cars? Well, there were, there were lots of reasons. I think the first one is that a bigger car, you felt safer in a big car. You felt that it was protecting you and protecting your family. Um, the other thing is that you, you felt that, what if you had to sleep in the car? If you needed to sleep in the car, you could stretch out on those big seats. 
Uh, they didn't have bucket seats in those days. They were those nice uh, sofa-like seats. And you could pull up your blankets if you needed to pull over by the side of the road because you couldn't stop at a hotel. But there were other reasons as well. You had to carry lots of gear. You needed a big trunk and lots of space. So if you had your family in the back seat, you could use that nice, spacious trunk for blankets and pillows and sheets. The sheets were used as partitions if you um, uh, needed privacy. Um, you might carry, my parents always carried one of those big green Coleman coolers full of food so you didn't have to stop at a restaurant. Um, you might carry, my grandmother always carried a, uh, one of those large coffee cans. Um, do you know, the, know what that was for? That was a pecan. That was a pecan. Well into the 1960s, my grandmother always insisted that my father carry that can in the car, and I could never understand, Nana, why do we have to carry that can in the car? But I understood it as I started doing um, this research. You might carry extra fan belts. You might carry water for the radiator. Um, you might carry a couple of cans of gasoline because you couldn't stop at a service station. So with all of this equipment that you carried, um, you needed a really big car. And importantly, I think, it was harder to turn over. If you encountered an angry mob, it was really hard to turn over some of those big, heavy cars. And people actually thought about that when they were buying these cars. People actually thought about that. Mm -hmm. So what brands? What brands did uh, African Americans uh, prefer? So my research showed that the preferred brand was a Buick, a big, heavy Buick. Um, the kind of stereotype of African Americans buying Cadillacs is not true. 3% of African Americans bought Cadillacs, which is exactly the same proportion of, um, ca of Cadillacs that white people bought, 3%, that's it. Um, and a lot of the Cadillacs that African Americans bought were purchased by people who could well afford them. Mahalia Jackson had a Cadillac. Sammy Davis Jr. had a Cadillac. Chuck Berry had a Cadillac. It's now at the Smithsonian. Um, and if, there's a photograph of Chuck with his Cadillac, with the big fins um, in the book, uh, which is one of my favorite, <laughs> favorite photographs. Um, but people liked big, heavy Buicks and um, fast Oldsmobiles were popular as well. The Oldsmobile 88, which had a really fast engine. If you can imagine driving the back roads of Alabama or Mississippi um, for the NAACP, Medgar Evers drove a Rocket 88. If you were being pursued by a, a Klansman or a nasty mob, you just touch that accelerator and that Rocket 88 would take off. And a fast car, a strong, heavy car, well, that's exactly what you wanted. Mm. You mentioned that uh, the car may be used for a lot of things that white people took for granted when they traveled. Hotels, sleeping in the car, uh, gas station. You did point out, though, that there were some companies that would cater to Africa. I don't know if I'd say cater, but at least would uh, welcome African Americans. And Esso, for example, do you remember Esso? Gasoline. I think Exxon. it became it became Exxon. Yeah, but Esso was a brand of gas stations, and back in those days, of course, they had real gas stations, not convenience stores. But <laughs> Esso was a brand that African Americans sought out. Why? Well, I think that I have a theory about this, and I actually didn't put it in the book because I can't prove it. But the Rockefeller family owned Standard Oil, and um, the Rockefellers were devout Baptists, and they believed wholeheartedly in, um, in integration. And they still, to this day, the, Rockefellers, um, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund funds African American causes. And I, th I think that um, Esso Gasoline, which was part of Standard Oil, um, had a, they had a non-discrimination non policy. And I think a lot of that comes from the Rockefeller legacy. Um, so they had a non-discrimination non policy for their gas stations. So their gas stations would allow African Americans to use the restrooms. And when I did oral histories, person after person after person told me, I only stopped for SO gas. I only stopped for SO gas. And my parents always bought their gasoline um, at SO stations because African Americans could use the bathrooms. 
Was that in uh, the Green Book? But I'm just curious. So if you, if you look at the Green Books, if you go through the, the Green Books, you'll find advertisements, many advertisements for Esso gas stations. Mm. So the book had a lot of examples, a lot of great stories. When they say great stories, they're stories uh, that aren't so positive. But what are some of the stories that to you were most memorable that you put in the book about the African Americans not being able to stay at a hotel or uh, say they were uh, involved in a minor crash where someone had to go to the hospital. What are some of the stories that would almost be hard to believe today? Wow. Um, one of the stories uh, that I think is, is interesting and, and it's a little bit funny in a, in a kind of horrific way, um, there was a, a young boy who was nine years old and he was traveling to a funeral with his aunt and uncle. He was the only one in the car who could read. His aunt and uncle couldn't read. Um, and they were traveling from California and they were headed um, to Florida for the funeral by car in a big old Chrysler. And um, they made a wrong turn, read the signs incorrectly, and they made a wrong turn and ended up on a main street in Waco, Texas. And as they were going very slowly down the street, looking out the window, they could see that a crowd had gathered. And they're just trying to figure out what's going on. So they're, they're just looking, at the, looking out the window, and they realize that the local townspeople are about to light a black man on fire um, in the middle of the town square. And when, um, as they pass, and they're driving slowly, the, the people that are about to commit this murder um, see them and say, let's get them and they run for their trucks and cars to chase the family. Um, so the family, now, now imagine they've got this huge Chrysler and they have to make a K-turn to turn around and get out of town. So they, they make their turn, they, they get out of town and they spend the night hiding in a field of tall grass with their lights out, terrified because they can hear the trucks and the cars looking for them. But they hide and they get away. And the first thing that they do when they get back to California, what do you think? Sign up for reading classes. <laughs> because it was the fact that they couldn't, the, the aunt and uncle couldn't read that they got into trouble in the first place. So I thought that was... Uh, it's a, you know, it's a little bit of a funny twist to that story, but they made it, they, were, they survived. Um, there are many other stories about um, people who are traveling who get into automobile accidents. If you can imagine, what was it like to get into an automobile accident? It really took a lot of courage to go out on the road. Um, because if you got into an automobile accident, where did you go, what did you do? There were only 200 black hospitals in the United States in the 1950s. 200. So if you were in a place that had no black hospital and the white hospital wouldn't receive you, you were out of luck. So that's what happens to a lot of performers and it's what happens to a lot of African Americans who, uh, Bessie Smith for example, um, in 1923 she gets in a terrible car accident, her arm is almost severed um, and she can't get, um, she can't get medical care because there's no local black hospital. There were many actual um, uh, teams, sports teams from, from black colleges that would not send their students out on the road because they were afraid of what would happen if they got into an accident. They were afraid that they wouldn't be able to, they, they, would, they would die because there would be no care for them. There actually are some cases that you cite in the book of African Americans who did die, who did die as the result of an accident that maybe if they had been treated like any other person, they would have lived, right? Yes, so, so there's one story about two students from Clark University who are um, badly injured in an automobile accident and they are taken to one hospital and the hospital turns them away and says, Nope, you've got to go to another hospital. They're taken to another, a second hospital, and that hospital does a little first aid and, and sends them away. 
and they're finally treated at a third hospital 50 miles from the original site of the accident, one of them, one of them dies. And there are so many stories like this um, that it was actually, it's, it's, it's really kind of frightening. It's, it's really an aspect of American history that we know so little about, or, and we've forgotten. And I think that uh, throughout the book, there are numerous examples of that. Uh, I think when you heard earlier in the program about how America has changed, many of us living today find this so hard to believe, but it wasn't that long ago. I mean, many of us live, were living during this time. Our parents certainly were living during this time. You also write in the book that uh, there were occasions where an ambulance would have to be sent out, that either the hospital or the ambulance would ask whether the victims of the accident were black or white. Right, and I, I hadn't even realized that ambulances were segregated as well. So the, if, 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 um, if there was a hospital that had a Negro ward, as they called it, um, they'd have to ask when the person was injured, do you need the black ambulance or the white ambulance? Now the black ambulance was not allowed to go out until the white ambulance had picked up the, um, the white people. So if there was an accident invo involving a black driver and a, a, and a white driver, the white ambulance would be called first. They would pick up the white person, take them to the hospital, and then the black ambulance would be called. So I, I talked to a, a black ambulance driver and he said, well, very often they weren't called until the white ambulance had already left the scene. So you know the, that golden hour, that, that amount of time that you have before um, uh, to survive if you're in a serious car accident, if you're bleeding. Very often um, African Americans didn't even get picked up until that white ambulance had, had already left the scene. And then you would be taken, if you were taken to the white hospital, if they had a Negro ward, um, and the ward was full, if it only had for perhaps five beds, um, they would have to find a black hospital, if there was one nearby. So really, going out on the road was extremely dangerous, and I think very courageous for African Americans who said, we're gonna take our kids um, our, and our families out on the road because it's an important way of showing that we are Americans, that we are entitled, and that we, we enjoy driving, that we like um, to drive, and that we're going to um, push um, integration through travel. What were sundown towns? Sundown towns were cities and, um, and towns that were um, all white, and that African Americans were allowed to be in during the day to work. They could work as gardeners or as chauffeurs or maids or cooks, but you had to be out of the town by six o'clock at night. You had to be out by sundown. And there were sundown towns all over this country. Um, we think of them mostly in the south, but actually there were probably more sundown towns in the Midwest um, and the West, and there were, Darien, Connecticut was a sundown town. Um, many of the sundown towns still, to this day, do not have um, any African Americans living in them because of their terrible reputations. And I talked to uh, a man in Alabama who was telling me about Coleman, Alabama, um, and he, to this day, won't go to Coleman, Alabama because um, of its reputation as a, a, a kind of scary place for African Americans. Mm. Before the automobile, how did African Americans travel? African Americans traveled just like everybody else before the automobile by, by train um, and then later by bus. Um, but for African Americans, those trains were segregated. And when buses become popular mode of transportation, those two were segregated. The back of the bus was the, the place that African Americans had to sit. Um, the segregated, the, the train cars were segregated, um, usually put right behind the engine, um, belching out these coal burning engines. They were dirty, they were rarely cleaned, the bathrooms were never cleaned. Um, they were pretty terrible um, and disgusting uh, places to, to ride, and they were humiliating. 
you know, it was it was humiliating to say, I'm sorry, but because of your because of the color of your skin, you've got to go sit in this uh, in this particular place. Mm. Many people are aware of uh, buses and African Americans having to sit in the back of the bus, but there were buses that traveled across state lines. Some states. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but some states, this wasn't something that was enforced as stringently, but there were states where when you got to the state line, African-Americans would have to, the bus would not move until the African-Americans went to the back, correct? And that happened on trains as well. So the, the whole issue of interstate travel was really, um, was really problematic because if you were going from, say, New Jersey where the, where the bus or the train might not be uh, segregated to Virginia, or the, the Seaboard Coastline train went all the way from um, New York all the way down to Florida. Yes, you've taken it, I, I, I see. Um, and um, that train, at, at, in, during part of its history, was segregated. Um, generally, the conductors would try and shuffle the African Americans into the segregated car so that they didn't have to ask them to move when it got to Washington, D.C. Um, so it was more convenient for the, the conductor if he could get the black people into that car so that he didn't have to go in and say, I'm sorry, but you have to move. Um, so people might buy a, you could buy a first class ticket. You could be a black woman and or man family that bought a first class ticket because you could afford to buy a first class ticket um, and the co conductor would say, once you got to the Mason-Dixon line, you had to move. Or they might just put you in that segregated car right from the beginning for convenience. Now, notice we were talking about uh, interstate travel. Uh, there was a lawsuit filed uh, over the Interstate Commerce Act. Explain what the Interstate Commerce Act was and how this applied to interstate travel for blacks. So the Interstate Commerce Act um, was a federal legislation. The states determined segregation state by state, but it was federal legislation that um, the, decided by the Supreme Court that actually ended segregation. And so um, since buses and trains went through different states, um, they used the Interstate Commerce Act as a way of deciding that segregation was illegal. So it was federal legislation rather than state legislation. Mm. But again, that was, you mentioned the Supreme Court had made a ruling, but there were some states that didn't, even though the Supreme Court said this is the law of the land, who said, uh-uh, we're not going to uh, obey. Oh, well, sure. And I, you know, I, I think about that a lot because... Um, it, you know, it's very much like the end of, of slavery. Um, who told the slaves in the, you know, I've, I've seen actual um, notices of, of people being enslaved in the 1850s in, in far upstate New York because nobody told them. And I think with, the, um, with segregation, it was very easy for a hotel owner to say, to take a look at someone and see that they were black and say, oh, I'm sorry, we just rented the last room. How would you know? Um, I don't think that segregation um, in public accommodations ended overnight. It, it certainly didn't end overnight. Um, and I actually have a, a, a story. Um, when I was in my 20s, my grandmother died, and we went to Fayetteville, North Carolina, for the funeral. And um, being a good Episcopal girl, I was going to wear a black dress, but my aunt informed me that um, because they were all Baptists, that I was going to wear a white dress to the funeral. Um, and actually I said, no, I'm not. And she said, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go and take my cousin downtown in Fayetteville to buy a white dress. And we went into a store, and this would have been in the 70s. We went into a store in the 70s and waited and waited and waited to be waited on and didn't get waited on. And it didn't dawn on me until later what was going on. As a kind of naive person from New Jersey, it really didn't, I wasn't even thinking about discrimination. I thought, wow, that's a very rude 
um, store person. They're not waiting on us. But later on, I, I thought about it, but this is the 1970s, you know, and, and who was going to stop that person from discriminating? I'm curious, the, the, the trips that your family made to Fayetteville, uh, you know, as a child, you said you noticed, you thought your parents were peculiar, but did you personally ever experience any discrimination or anyone treating you or your family differently on those trips? I think, no, I didn't. Um, and I think that's because we were um, centered in the black community in Fayetteville and never left it. You know, we would, uh, it, was in, it was always interesting to me because I lived in this integrated community in, in Newark. Um, and then we would go to this, this all black community, went to the Baptist church, went to, um, you know, a black owned store that my uncle owned, but never really went, went beyond that black community. Mm. So talking a little bit more about history, there was one color that uh, many businesses understood, and that was green. Uh, after World War II, there was a, a black middle class that was growing, and there were a lot of white-owned businesses that understood, hey, these African Americans have money. So even though they may have discriminated in many cases, and still did in many cases, they also were taking uh, African-American customers, too, because they wanted their money, right? Absolutely. Um, and there was also a growing, um, there was also a, a group of growing um, white liberals who were really interested in integration and who were really interested in, in changing the way the, the United States operated. Um, and there are actually more, there are more travel guides than just the, the Negro mm -hmm. Motorist Green Book. And um, several of those travel guides were actually designed not only for black people, but for white people who were interested in integration and who wanted to stay in hotels and um, use restaurants that were integrated. So I think that is um, a really important aspect of that, the Green Book story. The Green Book's not the only, the only travel guide. Um, and there were many um, you know, empathetic, um, white people who were interested in integration as well as black people who were interested in um, integration. I want to talk more about the civil rights era in just a moment, but since we're talking about the business, uh, you write in the book that after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, when many more African Americans had money uh, and there was law against discriminating against a person based on their race, that a lot of blacks started patronizing white businesses and it hurt black businesses. It did. Um, and and that's, a, you know, that's kind of the irony of the story. But I think what happened was that African Americans had worked so hard to break open Hilton, Howard Johnson's, you know, the major chain hotels, um, restaurants. They had worked so very hard to break those open that they, that they went there because they could. Now they could do it. Um, the NAACP had made test cases of, of Hilton Hotels and, and of Howard Johnson's. Um, I think the problem was not so much that African American, that all African Americans pulled out of uh, support of black businesses, but that white Americans didn't support any of those black businesses. And so there was just enough loss of black support that those businesses um, couldn't be sustained, um, but there was no support of those businesses by, by white Americans. What kind of businesses, black businesses, were hurt? Well, there were tourist homes and guest houses, hotels and restaurants, um, motels, clubs, all kinds of, um, there was almost a parallel society within the black community. Um, if you think of just, a, just about any business that you would find in the white community, you would also find in the black community. The only businesses that survived were things like um, funeral parlors and churches, um, some restaurants. Um, excuse me? Barbershops. Yes, barbershops. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned restaurants, and this kind of goes to the civil rights era and how the income from – 
there were restaurants that uh, uh, black women in particular were the cooks or the owners that whites would patronize those businesses because the food was so good. But what they didn't realize, the whites that patronized those places, is where some of the money was going. And I love that story because um, women, women play a significant role in this, in this story. Um, women that were cooks in white households, they were making, they were busy at night making cakes and coconut cakes and sweet potato pies and frying chicken and making sandwiches. And they were selling it. They were selling it in their communities. And they were taking that money and using that money to, to fund the civil rights movement. And they were giving substantial amounts of money every week to the civil rights movement. Um, and that money was coming from white people that really liked that food, <laughs> but didn't necessarily support the civil rights movement. They were supporting it whether they wanted to or not, which is, I think, a wonderful, a wonderful aspect of the story. Well, one of the ways that they did support it is, as we know, there were many civil rights leaders who were arrested uh, for different crimes or whatever, breaking the law. And uh, many of those uh, restaurant owners, those businesses, used that money to uh, bail, them bail them out, out. right? Yes, and there were restaurants, uh, Pascal's, for example, in Atlanta, they would have, they would provide dinners for people when they got out of jail. Um, they would provide meeting places for people to uh, meet up with their children when their children were incarcerated. So um, a lot of the, the black businesses were supporting the civil rights movement at their own peril. Um, and they were using, not only funding it, but providing other aspects of support. If you think about um, the civil rights movement, when people went south, when civil rights workers went south or when they um, came to a city, they had to have places to stay and they had to have food to eat. And it was the, the black restaurants and the black hotels and motels and guest houses that were providing places for them to eat and places for them to stay at their own peril. When did uh, the Green Book, and as you said, there were more publications, other publications, when did they stop publishing? Uh, the Green Book, its last edition is in 1966. They actually tried to um, kind of bridge the um, uh, integration gap and become a general um, travel guide. But by that time, the, there was the AAA guide, there was the mobile guide, there were all kinds of other travel guides, and they just couldn't, um, it, it could, just couldn't be sustained. Reason I ask about that is because, okay, 1966, there still is, we're in the midst of the civil rights movement. Did it stop publishing and decide to, to make that change for everyone because there had been strides made? It was the legislation. After the federal legislation, the Civil Rights Act was passed in 64, there was this kind of gradual decline um, of, the, of the purchase of those green books and that it went out of business in 66. Mm -hmm. You said that uh, the, the Green Book was one way in which uh, African-American travelers would find out places where they could stay. Mm -hmm. But there were other ways, too. Word of mouth. One thing I found very fascinating was uh, there would be travelers who would go to a church and talk to a minister. Right. If you were just arriving in a, in a small town and you would, you'd look for the black community, you might stop at the pastor's house, the minister's house, and ask the minister, he would always know where there was a family that might have an extra room and that you could stay in that, you could stay in that room. Um, or you might stop at the black, any black business and ask if they knew of a place to stay. And this happened, um, you know, it happened for baseball players, it happened for uh, musicians, anyone who was regularly traveling um, might have to do that if they couldn't find a place and if, if there was no place listed in the Green Book or in one of the other travel guides. But usually you would plan ahead. African Americans didn't go out on the road without planning where they were going to stay that night because it was, it was too dangerous and it was too chancy. How far away from home did they have to plan for? Um, most people planned for the entire trip. So you would you know, spread everything out on that dining room table. That's what my father did, get your maps, um, spread everything out on the dining room table and just plan your vacation. 
Well, I'm just wondering non-vacation. Say you're traveling 50 miles away from home. I guess it depended on where you lived, but if you were 25 miles away from home, 50 miles away from home, did you even have to plan that short of a trip? So I, th I think you planned every single trip. I, there was one story that was told to me about a, a, a person who lived in Boston, Valerie Cunningham, remembered her, um, remembered her father getting very nervous because he was very dark-skinned and his wife was very light-skinned. Um, and he was afraid that if he was stopped in Boston by the police, that they would think he had a white woman in the car. And so she would often um, ride in the back with their, with their daughter so that he could pretend to be the chauffeur just in case. Um, and it, he was very nervous driving just because he felt that um, that, was a, that was really dangerous to be, to be caught with a white woman in the car who was really a black woman and his wife. Mm. You know, and now I'm going to jump way back, but uh, okay. it just shows the kind of heritage there is and the kind of history. But you write in the book that even in colonial, that even this started way back in colonial times, that blacks could not gather like more than 10 people at a time, I don't know, maybe right. not even that many, because they were afraid that they would murder the white slave owners. I think that any any story like this has to start with slavery because it, it really helps you to understand how mobility was restricted for African Americans from the very beginning um, and how the police, uh, many of the police departments that were started in this country were started as slave catchers. That was the reason that um, some police departments were, were started. So you can, you can really start to see why the relationship with the police is, is pretty terrifying for African Americans. And then when you think about um, Southern police officers who were tied directly to the Klan, who were members of the Klan, um, you, you can understand why African Americans are so wary of the police, um, both North and South. You mentioned in the book, and this is a good segue, uh, you mentioned in the book near the very end that you yourself are a little leery of, of police officers, even though you really have had no uh, bad experiences, should I say? I've never had a bad experience. I had Actually, I have one bad experience with a, a police officer, but I think that um, actually uh, doing this <laughs> research made me even more wary um, of the police because I think... I think that you never know who you're going to encounter. And I'm certainly not, I don't think all policemen are bad. I think that um, most policemen are probably okay, but they're afraid. And they have been conditioned by our culture to be afraid of people because of the color of their skin. And that makes them um, dangerous if you're black. Um, I think they're more dangerous to black men than they are to black women. I think because they're afraid of black men. Um, and I'm constantly telling, I have a black son, and I have a black son-in-law. And um, what they always say is, Mom, you know, stop. You know, we're, we're OK. But I've had the talk um, with them about how you behave when you're stopped by the police. And I think it's very important. And, and I think every black mother has that conversation with her black son. Um, and it was, it's been interesting to me, as I've been talking about the book, people say, really? I, I never would have thought of having a conversation with my son about how to behave with the police. And I say, that's because you're not black. <laughs> um, because if you're black, um, you, you have the talk. And what does that talk sound like? What, do, what, what conversation did you have with your son about what to look out for? Um, I live in a fairly white community, and my son, a um, very popular kid, would be driving around with all these white girls in his car, um, and I would say to him, if you are stopped by the police, don't move. Don't touch your phone. Keep your hands on the wheel. Always be polite. Turn the light on in the car. Always be polite. Don't back talk. Um, one of my colleagues, who's a curator at the Smithsonian, Faith 
Ruffins, she said um, something really prophetic. She said, if you get stopped by the police, your job is to stay alive long enough for us to get to you. That's your job. Stay alive long enough for us to get to you. She said, we'll get, get you a lawyer. We'll get you out of jail. We'll do whatever needs to happen. But you've got to survive that encounter with that police officer. Um, so you have to be incredibly, even if you're stopped for no reason, even if they force you to get out of the car for no reason, you have to be incredibly polite um, your opportunity to protest comes later with a lawyer, <laughs> but you have to survive that in, that encounter. You said that uh, as you were researching the book, you were more leery of uh, police stops. And I'm always curious, many of the examples that you gave were in the South. And I think that uh, many of us probably, if we stereotype, we think about that uh, old Southern sheriff, but that isn't necessarily the case. That's not necessarily the case. Um, and, and several of the states that have had problems are, well, two of the states that have been test cases for uh, problems with the police are Maryland and New Jersey. Um, the New Jersey state troopers have, uh, have been very problematic. And the, the um, Chuck Berry song that, uh, is it Maybelline? That's about the being stopped on the, <laughs> on the New Jersey Turnpike by the police. Um, and, and being a person from New Jersey, it's very interesting. I was talking to my hairdresser about um, New Jersey, growing up in New Jersey. And she said to me, you know, New Jersey was a Klan state. And I said, no, New Jersey's not a Klan state. And, and she said, no, 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 I remember New Jersey's a Klan state. And I said, Vernell, New Jersey is not a Klan state. So I went and looked it up, and New Jersey was a Klan state. <laughs> it was a big Klan state. Um, and, and I thought, wow, you know, the, the Klan was there. And she, she recounted a story um, about being afraid to go to Atlantic City from Brooklyn. She was from Brooklyn, um, and she was going to Atlantic City in the 40s. And she was afraid because of New Jersey's reputation. And with good reason. And she said, you know, when, when, she would, when she crossed the border from New York into New Jersey, she was looking at everybody's face. Is that a friendly face? Can we stop here? You know, would we be able to go into this store? Do these people look like they would hurt us? You know, and I thought, can, can you imagine driving like that, having to worry um, about whether or not people's faces look friendly? And if they don't look friendly, what are they going to do to you? I mean, it's a, it's a pretty scary, um, it's, it's something that we don't think about today, generally. Um, you might think about it in some parts of the country, yeah. but generally we feel comfortable when we get in our cars that we're going to be able to drive you know, where we wanna go. Um, mobility is um, really a part of a democratic society, being able to travel freely is part of a democratic society. And I think we, we tend to forget that it hasn't always been that way for African Americans. Is that the legacy, the takeaway from the book? I think that's one takeaway. Um, one of the things that actually that Norton asked me to do at the end of the book was to, um, to think about <clears throat> bringing the story up to the present. And one of the things that I did was talk with some people that I thought had something valuable to offer in terms of a, a conversation that we can begin about what we can do about this. What, how can we make it better? Um, and one in particular, I talked to Sylvain Bissonnette, who was a, the French um, commander of police in Montreal. And he had some wonderful ideas that I had never thought about. He said, um, in Montreal, he tells his policemen to think about, um, think about themselves as problem solvers, not law enforcers. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, that's a great idea. And he told me the story that in, in Montreal, they have a problem um, with Hasidic Jewish men on uh, Friday night. Um, it gets dark early, and they, will, they might just 
get it. If sundown comes, you know, you can't drive anymore, they might just leave their keys in the car, get out of the car, leave it in the middle of the road, walk away. <laughs> That's a big problem. So he said, how do you solve that problem? You don't solve that problem by calling the tow truck, having the car towed, going to the guy's house, arresting the guy, putting him in the system. You solve that problem by you getting it, you get in the car, pull it over the side of the road, turn it off. Problem solved. Um, you don't, you haven't spent any of the city's money. You haven't created a, a, a another case to go through the courts. You haven't, draw, you know, sent the tow truck out to to pick up a car and put in the impound yard. All that putting all that bureaucracy in place. You've solved a problem. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be great if our policemen thought of themselves as problem solvers instead of law enforcers? The other thing that he said that I thought was terrific was that when he's finished being a police officer for the day, his gun goes in his locker and he doesn't have it with him all the time. So he's not carrying a gun around all the time. Um, and I thought, gee, that's kind of a pretty wonderful thing. Um, and the other thing I think um, the other advice I got from him was that he thinks it's really important that police put as much energy into interpersonal relations as they put into going to the shooting range. They go to the shooting range all the time, right? They practice shooting those targets, but they don't practice de-escalating situations. They don't practice interpersonal relationships. They don't practice how do you work with people or talk to people or have relationships with, with people that are different from you. And I thought that was, that was really um, an interesting comment because we, we know that the police are required to um, practice shooting all the time, but they don't have to practice humanity, humanity skills. Um, and I thought, well, those, those, are some, those are some good, um, that's some good advice um, for all of us to think about. Gretchen Soren, author of Driving While Black, African American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank you. <laughs>If you recognize that, that I did that on purpose for the end of my program that we're going to be running here. So, but we still have, uh, Alex has a microphone here. That, here he is in the back. If you have a question, get his attention and uh, you'll get to ask uh, Ms. Warren a question. Thank you uh, so much for writing the book. It's really uh, has a lot of insight. Thank you. Uh, to all cultures and uh, it's very accurate. Just a couple of things. I can uh, remember traveling long distances with my family. And one of the reasons why fried chicken was used is that because deep fried chicken stays fresh unrefrigerated right. for days. Yes. And then stopping at a wayside at a, uh, at a farmer's uh, stand, uh, the most, uh, uh, how should I put it, uh, efficient uh, fruit to eat at that time, other than plums and uh, pears, was watermelon. And this is one of the reasons why fried chicken and watermelon are associated with African Americans. A couple of other things, inventions. The automatic transmission uh, was invented by an African American, as well as the supercharger system, as well as the oil pump, too. Uh, and these transformed a society worldwide. Um, one other uh, uh, short personal note, my uh, uncle was Bruce Boynton, uh, who uh, he and Thurgood Marshall, or Thurgood Marshall uh, actually uh, 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 defended him in court, and he, <clears throat> excuse me, that was the landmark uh, interstate commerce case. Mm -hmm. And his experience is what he said is that they, uh, the conductors on the buses and also the trains weren't nice by saying, oh, I'm sorry, you have to go to the back of the bus or the back of the train. They actually said, and what he had said, quote, get back in the back, Sambo. And he was afraid for his life. But that was, uh, that was the way that uh, African Americans were. There raised. are, um, a lot of the bus drivers were armed. And if you didn't do as they said, uh, often they would actually pull out a gun. And some people were shot. There were two soldiers who um, were a black, and, black soldier and a white soldier who were friends. 
sitting together on a bus, and the bus driver screamed at them to, to they couldn't sit together. Um, and when they said, no, we're, we're friends, we, we want to sit together, he pulled out a gun and started shooting. They had to go, they had to go running. But very often, that, that was the case. The bus drivers were, you're right, the bus drivers were not nice. The way the, excuse me, you mentioned in your book uh, or, um, or in the discussion about the attire uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, is appropriate to wear um, while driving. I know that, uh, you know, when I wear a tie and a suit jacket that I avoid a lot of confrontation just by the way that I, mm -hmm. that I dress. And this is one of the reasons why I like this rather than this skull cap right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Dr. Soren, thank you so much for coming to Harrisburg. Thank uh, you. I was wondering um, how the white racist establishment may have tried to restrict this freedom, specifically through um, insurance companies, what role did they play, and even driver's licensing. Thank you. Uh, I actually don't know about driver's licensing, but there were, uh, African Americans had a hard time getting insurance, and there were African American insurance companies that insured their automobiles. Um, but many white insurance companies tried to restrict uh, the ability of, of African Americans to, to, to get insurance for their cars, just as redlining restricted African Americans from buying houses. One of the reasons that African Americans were, were able to buy such large cars was that they couldn't buy a house. So they, their next large purchase was a, was a car. So, so yes, you're absolutely right. It was white establishment trying to prevent them from um, both owning, um, owning property and being able to, to drive. Uh, my wife has the book. I'm not sure where she is, Ruby. Um, three quicks. Um, in your survey, were there, were there instances where they changed the signs to reroute people so that they could not come to the south? And when traveling, were the fun black funeral homes uh, a preferred stop because it was less uh, noticeable that black people would stay at black funeral homes? Um, I don't think staying at a funeral home was preferred. <laughs> 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 if you were on vacation. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, you know, any port in a storm, I think if you, were, if you were stuck, you might stop at a back black funeral home. I think you'd prefer to stop at the church and talk to the pastor um, as, a, as a place to stay or, or at a, a shop, a store, or a restaurant if you, if you could. I don't think uh, a funeral home was, was preferred. What about the signs? Signs. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't know the answer to that. I've heard of that back. In, you know, I did extensive travel, and um, I've heard of it even in the early '80s, that supposedly in the southern areas they would actually mislead the signs to keep people from coming southward. I mean, I don't know if that's to true. To keep African Americans from coming south. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how would they change the signs? Would reroute them. You know, go south, but it, the sign would say go west or something else, just to confuse people. Yeah, I've heard I, of that. I think that once the interstate highways um, were built, African Americans preferred to stay on the highways and not to, not to even go off, off the highways into these little towns and not to go off the interstates. So you wanted to stay on the federal highways rather than you know, taking some little, little small, small route. Now in the 20s, you couldn't do that. But by the time you get to the 50s and you've got interstate highways, those, those signs are put up by the federal government. They're not put up by the local municipality. And I think it was, it's less likely. Um, I, I've, I've actually, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether or not that was, was folklore or whether it was just, it happened in a few instances with local towns. I don't think it was a, a general policy. So your survey didn't actually focus in on it? In no, I actually looked at a lot of signs. I looked at a lot of, um, of road signs, which were offensive. There were a lot of road signs that were offensive. There were signs for, um, there were lots and lots of welcome to Klan country signs, which were definitely designed to um, deter you from 
it's from lingering in a particular place. Um, but I'm not sure whether or not um, signs were put up specifically to mislead you. I would have to think that one of the it, one of the things that we made progress we've made is that even white people today would not want to go into a town and say "Welcome to Clansville." <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> today, yeah. today, but the Klan yeah. used to be a, a, an acceptable. Um, Truman was a member of the Klan. I mean, it was a yeah. it was a men's club. The before. Bird, it was it, Senator I, Bird. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah there were quite a, quite a few people that were members yeah. of the the Klan. They claimed claimed it was a men's club. Yeah. So I want to say really quick, um, in this area now, when you talk to people, um, there are instances that, uh, are, of complaints of police officers actually positioning their vehicles to shine the lights to see actually who's in, in, in the yeah, you, know, sure. you hear that. And I'm thinking that must have been a big thing back then during uh, the Green Book and everything like that. I think um, there were lots and lots of, there were lots of rules for African Americans you know, you never go even one mile above the speed limit. I, you know, Martin Luther King, the first time he was arrested, I think they said he was going, uh, uh, I think, 30 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone. You know, you couldn't go even one mile an hour above the limit um, without, without getting arrested. So there were, there were lots of rules that you needed to abide by um, just to make sure you got out of town. Um, safely, and also they were African Americans were used as um, way as revenue generators. You know, so if an African American is going five miles over the speed limit, you stop that person. You know they're terrified. Um, you bring them before a judge, and that judge, you know, your your goal was pay your fine, get out of town, never come back. You know, so you know it was it was a way of generating revenue as well. So to cap off my discussion, um, Martin Luther King was a felon, Harriet Tubman was a felon, and so was Frederick Douglass, a felon. So to change things, you have to break the rules. Or the laws are, or the laws are unjust. Hi, I, I have to say that I learned something on every page of this book that I needed to learn. Oh, thank you. It was fantastic. Thank you. I wondered if you could just comment briefly about the visits of Khrushchev and of uh, Fidel Castro to the United <laughs> States. I thought that was very, very interesting. Um, when, when Fidel Castro came to the United States, he decided that he wanted to show what hypocrites um, the United States uh, Americans were. And so instead of staying at, well, he actually started out staying at a, a, a mainstream hotel and they threw him out. And so he went to the Hotel Teresa in Harlem, um, where he made a, a big show of uh, welcoming Ma uh, Malcolm X um, and uh, a variety of other visitors to his hotel room. He also uh, you know, killed a few chickens in the room and ground cigars in, into the rug and made quite a mess. But um, he really wanted to um, show the hypocrisy of the United States and to make, uh, make Cuba look good. Um, it, was, it was all over the black press. The um, white, mainstream white press tried not to cover it. It was a very sh small articles. But the black press had tons and tons of coverage, photographs um, of him in the hotel room, um, lots and lots of coverage of him visiting um, visiting Harlem. Does that answer your question? Yes. Gretchen, up and to your right. <laughs> Dr. Soren, thank you for the book and for this conversation. Oh, thank you. Um, having grown up while the civil rights battle was going on, I have very, very strong memories of Mississippi, Birmingham, et cetera. And most of my memories are very, very fearful at that time. I still don't think I would want to drive in any of the southern states. I just have, an, and maybe as a white person, you have more fear because you didn't go through it. But how do you feel about driving in some of those states now under our current 
more explicitly racist administration where more things are maybe tolerated and violence seems to be even encouraged at times. So how do you feel personally if you're driving through some of those heavy southern states or if your son was? Are you more intimidated now than you would have been 10 years ago? My husband is Jewish. So um, when we got married in the 70s, uh, it was illegal for us to be married in many of the southern states. So we have actually never traveled together in certain states in this country. And probably um, he wouldn't be interested in visiting those states today. <laughs> um, so um, I would say, um, I, I mean, I've, I've lived in Virginia for uh, three years. The two of us lived in Virginia. It was probably the most um, racist experience I've ever had in my life living in uh, Northern Virginia. Um, so um, I, would, I would say I'm a little wary about certain states, but I, w I think it would be better to travel um, by myself rather than with my husband. Hello, doctor. Thank you for uh, coming. I got one quick question. Right here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> uh, your book says Driving While Black. Have you done any research on the term black and where it origins from in this society and why people of color embrace that particular color? You know, um, the whole what we should call ourselves has been going on since the 1820s colored, Negro, African-American, Afro-American, black. I don't, um, I, I think the Black is Beautiful movement, you know, in the comes out of the 60s. Um, but I think African-Americans have been talking about this since the 1820s. Um, I'm not sure if it's ever really been settled. It, it goes in cycles. You know, my father always said Negro. That was, that was the word that was common and popular for his generation. Um, that's, that's about all I, I think I have to, to offer on that, that, <laughs> that topic. But, the, but the, many of those terms that were accepted today are offensive. Um, yes. I mean, if I... If someone, a white person, referred to you as colored, what would you think? I've had that experience. Really? <laughs> oh, yes. Really? Yes. Um, colored is offensive. I, I use Negro a lot in the book because of the time period of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and also, we have the, uh, you know, the NAACP. You know, we have certain organizations that have traditionally, you know, we wouldn't change the name of the NAACP, I don't think. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it depends on the context. Um, that experience, someone called you colored? When we lived in Virginia, somebody called me a negress, which I thought, Really? Wow. Really? Like, where are you from? That, and that's 1820s there. Somebody in upstate New York told a colleague, did you know that she was colored? And, I, and the two of us were kind of perplexed at what century this person <laughs> lived in. But I, I think, you know, it's, um, there's still a lot of prejudice in this country. Yeah. Yeah. There's still a lot of racism. Yeah. I just have a story to share, and this happened, I think, in the early 2000s. And I, I live, we have the East Shore and we have the West Shore. So you have the Susquehanna River that separates. Of Maryland? No, no here. right here. Here. Oh, right of, here, of Harrisburg. We're on the East Shore of the Susquehanna River. River. Oh. And then there's the West Shore. And did you know that Cooperstown is the source of the Susquehanna? We did. Yes. <laughs> so there, Anyway, two young black men ran out of gas, and I saw them pushing their car. And so I pulled over and said, hey, you need to ride to the gas station. And they got in the car, and they went, oh, my God, we were so afraid. 
we were so afraid because the West Shore, they called the White Shore, and they were afraid. Oh, really? Yes, yes. yes. and yes. they were afraid because they ran out of gas, and they were like, oh my God, thank God you picked me up, because they were so afraid, and it, it really opened my eyes, and this was just in the early 2000s, so really opened my eyes. Yeah, I think of Howard Beach, where that hmm. young man um, in Queens was <laughs> murdered um, because he was, in the, he was in the wrong white neighborhood. I, another comment, um, I worked for the Department of Ed for a lot of years, and I worked with the Human Relations Commission, and there was, a, there's, you know her, Ann Van Dyke. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and she, I remember when she told me, it's not just New Jersey, uh, that Pennsylvania had the second largest number of hate groups. That's um, still true. And it's still true, and matter of fact, I'm, I head up an organization, Hershey, which is very white, and um, but a liberal progressive organization in Hershey, and Anne's coming to talk on May uh, 13th at the Hershey Library. I'm going to plug it um, about uh, the state of hate in Pennsylvania. So it's alive and well. And uh, matter of fact, the uh, guru of the KKK for a lot of years lived in northern Pennsylvania. He's the Grand Dragon. Oh, wow. Pennsylvania is believe me, alive and well. You don't want to get lost up in, the, in northern Elk County or any of those others. I don't even know what to say. I know that, I know that um, having students from all over the country, I know that some of them do refer to certain parts of Pennsylvania as Pennsylvania. I've heard, I've heard that. I've and heard we're not that. real proud of that, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, it's yeah. Phil, yeah. yeah. <coughs> I, you know, I think, um, I think the country is, is pretty divided. One of the really sad things is that people don't know each other. Um, the Green Book, uh, the mantra of the Green Book was travel is fatal to prejudice. And the idea was, which comes actually from Mark Twain, that was something that Mark Twain said in The Innocents Abroad. Um, and I think Green adopted it as his mantra because he felt if people could meet each other and have conversations with one another and, and really know each other, that would really help to, you know, to defeat prejudice. I think the problem, this country is becoming incredibly segregated. It's resegregated. Um, and people don't go to school together. They don't get to meet one another. They don't get to know one another. And I mean, I love to see a crowd like this because, wow, it's an integrated audience and people can talk to one another and um, be civil to one another. But I think in so many parts of the country, you know, the audience is going to be either all black or all white. And there's, there's no, um, you know, the, people don't know each other. How would you evaluate the ingenuity of white people to oppress the black people versus the ingenuity of the black people to get around that oppression? So it's just a contest. <laughs> I would say that um, white people had a lot of power, um, but the, right, power and privilege, but that the black people um, figured out every possible way around that power and privilege. Um, I, I think one of the, the funniest parts of the book was about passing. So that um, I, I talked to, um, gonna, I'm, it's not Leah Chase, but uh, I can't, I'm sorry, I'm, I just lost her name. But uh, the woman whose husband founded Dookie Chase's restaurant in, in New Orleans. Um, and she just died um, last summer. Um, and her daughter's name is, is Leah. Uh, she talks about how white people were completely unaware. White people are so bigoted that they just assume that if you're white, you would never pretend to be black. And if you're black, you couldn't possibly pretend to be white. So there were lots of folks who were passing all the time. The one, if, they were, if they had light skin, they would go to the movie theater and and pass, or they would go to a store and pass. 
just because they could, and the white people never knew. There were also instances where musicians who were in mixed race bands, um, who were very white, blue eyes, blonde hair, white people, you'd look at them and say, that's a white person. But the police would say to them, are, are you white or black? And they'd say, oh, I'm black. And they'd say that because a mixed race band was not allowed to play in that town. So the, the police would go, are you, are you white or black, black? White or black, black? White or black, black? And they would all say they were black, and of course the police would believe it because what white person would say they were black? <laughs> right, so I mean, if, uh, those are a, just a couple of examples of kind of the kind of cluelessness of, of white people about black people. You know, because they, they wanted to believe that they could always tell if you were black or white. And it also shows you how silly race is, this notion of race, of skin color. You know, there, there's no such thing as race, really. We talk about it, but skin color is such a, an insignificant aspect of our DNA. It's so insignificant, and we, we talk about it all the time because it's a social construction, and we've constructed these barriers between people. Uh, you know, we're saying, okay, you're black and you're white, and I'm sure that a lot of the white people in this group have a lot of West African in them, um, and, and I'm, I know that all the black people in this room have a lot of white, you know, have a lot of European and other Scandinavian. I'm 20% I'm Scandinavian, don't I look it? You know, that's what <laughs> First my thing DNA I thought says. of. <laughs> That's what my DNA says. You know, so the, the, rate, the whole idea of race is, is nonsense. But it's a social construction that we use as a way of separating people. And we have used it for centuries. And it's, you know, as a historian, I talk about it because it is a social construction, but it is nonsense. So unfortunately, we are out of time, so this will be our last question. Hi, doctor. Thank Hi. you. I appreciate you. I appreciate your status, your intelligence. And oh, thank you. You're a writer. I'm, I'm a writer also. I just started. <laughs> but Good for I'm you. Nowhere. Keep at it. I want to be you one day. <laughs> <laughs> Keep at it. Thank you. But I have a personal question um, on identification. Uh, how do you identify yourself? I value your opinion. <laughs> how do I identify myself? Yeah. As far as race. Well, you said race is doesn't mean anything, but... I'm know. a black woman with biracial children and a Jewish husband and a member of the human race. That, uh, that would be how I... Oh, very <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. okay, so black woman, because that's how I identify yeah, myself. Absolutely. So I'm in good company. So one other question. So we were talking about the genes, the DNA and that. Does your book address uh, epigenes? Because there's a lot of buzz about the epigenes. I don't talk about DNA at all. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. If I was a biologist, maybe I would talk about DNA. It's not, it's not part of the story. Okay. I want to thank Scott and Gretchen. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> thank you.